going to cover the basics, and basically what I'm going to do, and the people that arrived here a little earlier um, saw me uh, using this to test the sound system and everything, but I, I've disconnected everything because I want to show you that it's really easy to just start from scratch and hook this stuff up, and it just works. And I've, I've done this many, many times, and so far, uh, so good. So um, I'm going to give you an overview of, of what we're going to be talking about. And um, uh, after some introductory comments, I'll conduct a live ripping session. So you'll see just how this, this process uh, unfolds. And then while that's in progress, uh, while you know, we're going to do a couple tracks off of some records, uh, I'll uh, take some questions from the audience uh, while we're waiting for that process to finish. And then um, uh, I'll do a few more things, and then we'll have questions at the end. So. Um, to do this process, you need three things. Uh, you need a computer, because we're ripping to digital. Um, you need an analog to digital converter. Everybody knows probably what a DAC is, digital to analog converter, but we need the opposite, analog to digital, and storage, of course. Um, and, oh, I should, I should say, before I forget, uh, thanks to Roy Hall and Leland Leard of Music Hall for loaning the turntable. Um, when I called them up and said I would like to borrow a turntable for this, uh, this purpose, and also we, we have a budget-priced audio room uh, up on the fifth floor on 580, uh, room 586. We've also got a high-end system in 582, but we want to show you that it's possible to get great sound at, on a really low budget, under 3500 with a turntable for everything, speakers, speaker wires, computer software, etc. Anyways, uh, they said, well, I guess you won't be wanting a USB turntable in Roy's voice, right? And I said, you're absolutely right, um, because we're going to be treating vinyl as a high-resolution medium here. USB turntables are for like kids that want to just rip their records, get them on their iPads, and don't care too much about the quality. A USB turntable has a built-in analog-to-digital converter, but these are budget price devices that are generally engineered to hit a certain price point. So not only is the turntable of eh, sort of iffy quality, but so is the analog to digital converter. And all the USB turntables I've seen that use a USB connection to your computer are limited to 44.1 or 48 kilohertz, which is a sampling rate on CDs, which is bad enough, but what's even worse is that they're limited to 16-bit word length. So you don't capture the full resolution of the signal that's on the analog. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit about why it's important to use a 24-bit word length instead of 16-bit. So anybody that's really tried to, to do this process with a USB turntable has probably been very disappointed and, and went back to their CDs as soon as they finished with their records, right? And if you do this properly, you won't go back to the CDs. You know, you're going to stick with the vinyl and, and really the, the the quality of the information that's on, on these platters is far better than CD. Now, that might sound crazy to some people, but what I will say is that some of the high-resolution digital downloads that are sourced from master tapes probably would be, be not vinyl, but that's because the source is, is good and your signal chain is, is preserving the information. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> with the presence of all these digital downloads, these high-resolution digital downloads, you might say, well, what, what's, the, what's the reason for vinyl to exist anymore anyways? Uh, which is the question that was asked when the CD was, was produced. And we know, we know how that went at this point, because vinyl is undergoing a tremendous resurgence in popularity. But now it's got some new competitors. And these are far more formidable competitors. But there's a couple things that they can never overcome. Number one. Um, the breadth and variety of music that's available on vinyl will never be duplicated in a digital format. Uh, I like to go to garage sales and find interesting stuff. And sometimes people have these really interesting eclectic collections. And you see some music in there that you know, and there's some music you don't know, and you figure, well, this guy has an interesting taste, and I'll try out this other stuff. The other problem is that these digital... Um, downloads or sourced from master tapes that have been sitting in various 
storage conditions, and sometimes they're just not in good shape. The signals are not really retrievable very well. Um, and I don't really want to say anything <coughs> uncomplimentary about some of these reissues or digital downloads, but a really good example is, um, and it really still it pains me, is the uh, Hendrix reissues. And um, a friend of mine that's a, um, uh, a audio journalist has is a really big Hendrix fan, and he has some of the original issues of these albums. And so we had a listening session where we were going to compare these with some of these reissues, which got the full approval of the Hendrix family uh, as, you know, these are good, we approve these. So we played the original issue, and then we put on the reissue, and it was like 10 seconds, couldn't bear it. Because probably what's happened is the master tapes have deteriorated, and they tried to cure that with some EQ or some other other restoration, it just doesn't do justice to the music. So to get this music, you really have to go back to the vinyl and, and search this out or, um, you know, just find new music. And it's great. Okay, so um, I deliberately chose a budget price turntable setup for this because I want to show you what's possible without spending lots of money. And then, of course, the sky's the limit from there. All right, so computer. Um, uh, very popular Apple Mac Mini. This is 600 bucks, and nowadays uh, you buy a memory upgrade for 100 bucks, uh, third-party memory upgrade, and you're all set as far as the computer goes. Uh, by the way, um, my experience is with the Macintosh Apple Mac platform for since about 1984, and um, there are solutions to accomplish this sort of thing on Windows and. There's free software available, and uh, it's, it's probably worth checking out. Uh, but um, my company, Channel D, makes this product called Pure Vinyl, and it was written from the ground up for this process out of a love for vinyl and making this process as easy as possible. And this product is, is just now hitting version 4, and each major iteration has seen major improvements in usability and, and ease of use. Okay. So we plug in the Mac, and I'll hook up the video. Okay, analog to digital converter. This is the other piece that you need. <clears throat> and I have several examples at the show. Uh, you can come to our exhibit room in 582 or 586. I have some low-cost versions for you to look at up in 586. Uh, starting at about 200 bucks, uh, Tascam US 366, and um, a very popular one, uh, RME, uh, sorry, the um, TC Electronic Impact Twin that a lot of our users really like. And we're actually using that for a DAC in our budget room, and I think it sounds really good. This is uh, made by a German company called RME. And by the way, all these companies have very big presences in the pro audio marketplace. And uh, these are really big companies. and the market in, in the pro audio is much larger for audiophiles, so the value that you get in these products is incredible, uh, low price and high quality. This goes for about 700 bucks. It's called the RME Babyface, and I like it because it goes in the carry-on bag and doesn't uh, take up too much room. Um, the, uh, RME, sorry, the, the TC Electronic Impact Twin is fairly sinister looking, and um, the, the Security people don't seem to mind very much because I think if someone was at, up to trouble, they wouldn't want to call attention to themselves by carrying all this stuff in their carry-on bag. They try to be a little bit more stealthy about it. So they just you know, swab it down for the, the mass spec to see if there's any nitrates in there. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to do now is hook this up with a USB interface cable, which supplies data. It's bi-directional data and also supplies power. So this is powered by the computer as well. So just one simple connection to this Fireface with the USB. And it, this is one thing that I don't really care so much for on this. It uses a, a D sub connector with this breakout cable. And I find that these things tend to fail uh, sooner or later. So far, so good. And the other interfaces I mentioned before, they don't use breakout cables. You plug things directly into the, into the box, which is, which is great. Okay, 
So I plug that in and it's been recognized by the computer and I'll hook up the audio outputs to the sound system here so we can hear what we're going to be ripping. And now I'll connect the turntable. Now, turntable going directly to the audio interface might seem a little strange because the turntable is microvolts to millivolts standard output. And um, you no normally think of these boxes as line level. But what we're going to be doing is using the built-in preamplifiers on this audio interface to amplify the signal up to line level. And this is all inside this box. And then it goes to the internal analog to digital converter. Um, my company also makes custom adapters here. This is an RCA to XLR adapter. And it has a built-in load resistor that for your cartridge load. So you can specify this and order this. These are, these are $35 a pair. And um, so you can get them for your cartridge, moving coil or moving magnet. And so this lets me connect the RCA outputs of the turntable directly to the audio interface. OK. Um, now what I'm going to do is I mentioned a little bit before that about the quality of the, the audio that's on an LP record compared to CDs. One, one thing about CDs is that because they are sampling at 44.1 kilohertz, there's the, the Nyquist theorem, which means that you can't reproduce any frequencies in the original recording above half that sample rate, so 22.05 kilohertz. And in practice, it's going to be somewhat less because of the uh, real life uh, digital filters. That's a brick wall filter, so there's nothing above about 22 kilohertz on a CD, nothing at all. On vinyl, there's, it's a different story because generally this is sourced, especially old vinyl, from analog sources. And some of these um, mastering tape decks can, can reproduce uh, signals in, into the hundreds of kilohertz range. So a lot of that information is actually transferred to the vinyl. And I'll show you that it goes to at least 100 kilohertz because there's no brick wall on vinyl. It's a gradual mechanical roll off, much gentler on the music than a digital filter. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up a spectrum analyzer, and we'll look at the spectrum of the music on this recording. Oh, by the way, what I'm doing here is I've got a laptop, which is it's connected by an Ethernet cable to the Mac Mini. It can also be a wireless connection, but I'm using screen sharing to control the, the Mac Mini, just the same as up in the exhibit rooms. Basically, what's appearing on your screen is also appearing on, on the screen on my laptop. It's a free feature on the Mac OS. Oh, helps to plug in the Ethernet cable. Okay, it sees it. Okay, don't need to connect to the network. Okay, and I'm going to fire, also fire up the application Pure Vinyl, which allows monitoring the audio. It also does something very important, which is supply the RIAA correction curve for the vinyl, and I'll get into that a little bit. Okay. All right, now I'll fire up the spectrum analyzer. And this is another product made by my company, which is a little bit out of date currently because it doesn't run on the latest Macintoshes because of changes they made in the hardware and OS, but we're going to be delivering an updated version. It's called Magnoscope. It's a spectrum analyzer. And um, the, the audio product I got it, I got it. I'm sorry, I had the noise generator turned on. Not my intention. Okay, um, let's see. Okay. Okay, uh, there's some noise there I'm a little concerned about, uh, but we'll see if we can I'll work around it.
got a 60 year old recording. So digital's finally caught up to 60 year old analog. <coughs> so, see this one? See, I've got Elvis's back. Okay. Um, sample rate. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that using a high sample rate is worthwhile. And especially nowadays with today's cheap hard disk storage, uh, it, you know, the, you're not saving any money and computers are so fast that even though you are dealing with lots more data on disk, uh, it doesn't really make a difference nowadays. Okay, the other important parameter in capturing this audio is word length. And I mentioned a little bit about that before. CD word length is 16 bits. So that's six, about 65,000 discrete levels are possible in that recording. Um, however, I like to use 24-bit. If you go onto some internet forums, they'll say, well, you know, vinyl dynamic range is only 70 decibels, and 16-bit audio has a dynamic range of 96 decibels. So why would you want to capture, waste that space? Well, it's not about the dynamic range. It's about the resolution and the fact that you have many more steps. You have 256 times more steps in the waveform levels, discrete levels that you can capture with 24-bit audio than with 16-bit audio. Uh, I like to use an analogy of if you see uh, steps going up to <coughs> like uh, a public building and there's a ramp for handicapped people, um, you can think of those steps as 16-bit audio and the ramp, the, the granularity and roughness of the concrete, that's about 256 times smaller than those steps, and that's what you're getting, much smoother representation of the audio with 24-bit audio. Okay. Um, so those are the two most important parameters. Um, setting signal level, of course, is important with digital audio. Uh, it's not like the old days with cassettes where you can slam those meters up into the red and it doesn't hurt the sound that much. Digital zero dB is absolute maximum level that you can re record. If the signal level goes above zero dB, it's lost. Uh, so the goal here is to try and it, it's really tricky because you want to get the signal level as high as possible to you know, improve the signal to noise ratio. But if, if you get too aggressive with that, then you're gonna clip and you're gonna lose information. Uh, there's some feature, a feature in, in this software, Pure Vinyl, that mitigates that problem and makes it something not worth worrying about. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, strategy. I like to do what's called lazy ripping. In other words, you know, you have 5,000 records. Uh, you get this notion that you want to capture them all to digital format so you can enjoy them on the computer. And you make a career out of this, and you don't enjoy it because it's a job. Lazy ripping is just play the records like you normally do, only now you hit the record button on the software and just record it. And next time you want to listen to that recording, listen to the digital copy instead. Save wear and tear on your stylus. Uh, I, don't, I don't really believe you wear out records uh, unless there's damage to your stylus. But you do wear out your styli, and maybe not for this, this uh, uh, cartridge, which is about 450 bucks. Uh, more expensive cartridges, um, if you do the math on the lifetime of those styli, every time you play a record, that's like a buck or two bucks. And you know, then you've got to change it. And sometimes those cartridges aren't made anymore. If you have a really nice cartridge, they go out of print. Um, so lazy ripping. Um, and then, of course, don't sell your vinyl after you do this. Of course, you, it's not really legal. But you're going to make improvements to your system anyways and you're going to want to hear the changes that you made. And now you have this perfect reference that you've made you know, with your old system. You can change your, your stylus rake angle. You can change your tracking force, change the cartridge, change the tone arm. And now you have all this basis for comparison of your favorite recordings. It's really nice. Um, OK, storage. I recommend using an ex external hard drive. Uh, for this purpose, I'm just going to be using the internal hard drive on this Mac Mini. But um, really, an external storage uh, device, not the boot drive, is, is advisable. It's just good computer operating practice. File formats. 
Um, I like to use lossless compression, Apple lossless, which is the same as a flat PCM file like AIFF. Wave, yeah, you can use Wave uh, as well, um, but I like Apple lossless. Uh, it's exactly equivalent to AIFF. And actually, AIFF has a problem with this type of, of thing because there's a hard limit on the maximum length of the file of four gigabytes, which means if you go beyond like a double album on, on one recording, it will fill up and, and it will be unusable. So you can't, uh, that's about 62 minutes at 192 kilohertz. So that's like a good size double album. Uh, use Apple Lossless, that's a f format in pure vinyl. Or um, there's another format called Sound Designer 2. It's, it's an older format, but it also has unlimited size. Okay. Um, so let's um, uh, rip an album. And uh, I'll just do a few tracks from the album. And then uh, while that's happening, uh, we can field some questions and I'll uh, try to remember anything I forgot to talk about. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, first I've got to change the speed on the turntable. The Elvis was a 45 RPM reissue. And I see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, one of these days, I'm actually going to change the music in this seminar, so. <laughs> Okay. All right, so this is, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Pure Vinyl 3, uh, now you'll see a little peek at Pure Vinyl 4, and that's going to be released on November 15th. Uh, I should also say that this is pre-release software, and I've never had problems with crashes or anything, but I like to take, take risks. So if, if something immediately, if there's an unexpected quit or something, that's part and parcel of this. But the, the version on the website now, 3.13 is, is completely bulletproof, uh, but there, there are a few glitches in there in this that still need to be worked out. All right, so um, let's see. I just want to check the input levels a little bit. And this interface has um, adjustable gain on the inputs, um, the um, microphone preamps, which is kind of nice. You just fire up a control panel, and then you just uh, crank up the gain. And I like to get the gain up to about at least minus 12, but not much more than about minus 6. That gives me some headroom to play with. Uh, in case there's an unexpected peak in the recording. So what you do is you find a, a record that is typical of a well-modulated record that you're going to be recording, something modern that has hot levels in it. You set your levels to that, and then you don't need to touch it again. Okay? The reason is severalfold. Um, number one, if you have a record with low modulation levels, the sound isn't going to be that great anyway, so you're not going to lose anything by not modulating enough. Another reason is, and it's something I haven't mentioned yet. Okay, this is a good level. Uh, it's because we're not using a conventional type of phono stage here. Uh, what we're doing is we're feeding the raw signal amplified into the analog to digital converter and applying the RAA correction in the digital domain. The RAA filter is a low pass filter. And if you look at an analogy that's very popular nowadays, Super Audio CD, DSD, when you convert DSD to PCM, it's a low pass filtering operation. You go from one bit at a really high sample rate to 24 bit audio, okay? Now, where does that extra resolution come from? Certainly, you can't take the 2.8 megahertz DSD and make that 24-bit. It's because you're low-pass filtering, and the mathematical operation of low-pass filtering does increase the resolution. Okay. Now, I'm not a mathematician, 
but I am a good experimentalist and I measure this and uh, this, it's in our, our AAS paper. You can download from our website. But basically the RIAA filter is not as aggressive as the low pass filter you use for DSD, but it's enough to gain you about an extra two bits worth of resolution. So the internal signal chain here is 64 bits. We're going in with 24 bit audio, the RIAA filter increases that to about 26 bits. Of course, you can never use that 26 bits externally, but what that buys you is an extra two bits of headroom here, and that's where this, this 12 dB, minus 12 number comes in. 12 dB corresponds to two bits. Uh, this also comes in handy when you're doing other operations that are um, possible with the software, which I won't cover some of the features like an electronic crossover and plugins. It's handy to have that extra resolution for that case as well. All right. So, uh, the way this works is you say click to record audio, and there's a slider here that says recording trigger, and what that does is it lets you s set a sensitivity level above which the software perceives that a recording is commencing. So, what I do is I fill in the artist information, and I'm using the this Apple lossless here, 24-bit, and this checkbox flat recording. And I see that um, someone's going to think I fibbed because that's actually pure vinyl 3 that's in there. And let me see. I thought I had pure vinyl 4. Boy, I'm going to be really uh, disappointed if I didn't copy that over here to show you guys. It's up in our exhibit room, and I'm, I'll be really disappointed if I don't have that here because I really wanted to show that. No, this is, I'm, I'm very sorry, but, uh, okay, well, I'll tell you what, what is in it. It's a much uh, simpler box here. The, there's a lot of stuff going on in here, lots of check boxes and stuff. And um, you get somebody like Michael Fremer, who's kind of spastic on the computer. He starts clicking things, and he clicks when he sh should double click, and he double clicks when he should single click, and and it's, it's a mess, and you know, I get this call, and it's like, oh, what's happening here? And, and so, so this has been really simplified, okay? So we've eliminated a lot of this stuff. Okay, so this, it's, it's a lot nicer, and I could show you if you come up in the exhibit room, and I'm really sorry that I didn't bring it down here. So there isn't going to be a crash. I know that. Okay. All right, so now that we set the triggering level, we hit record. And, uh-oh, it looks like I already did, uh, I'm gonna, I want to change the name slightly. Vagabonds RMAF 13. Okay. And that'll kind of be interesting because um, this is the first time I've used this cartridge and this turntable for this demo. So, okay. So now hit record. And now what it's going to do is wait until it detects the audio go above this threshold. And then it will commence recording. So, you know, you can take your time at this point. But you can't do anything that would generate noise on the stylus, or it'll, it'll think that you're, you're really starting to record here. All right, so I'm going to just capture a little bit. Uh, darn, because the, the automatic track re uh, recognition is a lot cooler on, on version 4. But it's, it's really cool on this, but it's a lot cooler on version 4. OK. So now it says recording. And what it will do is just continue recording until we um, uh, get to the end of the record. We'll lift the stylus and then it'll pause. Okay, so we'll record a few tracks from this album. Uh, I can field some questions now if anybody is uh, inclined. Yeah. And all the spaces in between the songs. Um, yeah, that's right, that's correct. And basically, when you set the trigger level, you're only setting it on the electronic noise that's coming from the preamp, okay? Now, when the stylus is in the groove, you've got more noise that's present in the signal. You've got turntable rumble. You've got the noise of the cutter head, uh, you know, crunching through the vinyl and all that stuff, and that pushes the signal level up above the, the trigger threshold. Now, it's very important that your playback setup be properly um, set up. Uh, if there's any background noise that's excessive, if there's any hum in there, what that's going to do is when you set the trigger level, 
you're going to set it to a higher level, and what's going to happen is that's going to be above that rumble, and it's going to do false identification of stylus lifts. So it's very important that you get the, the, get the system is set up properly. And this happens from time to time. The users will, will, will uh, call us and say, you know, uh, it's, it's generating these false stylus lifts, and, uh, and we're always able to resolve the problem. It's either um, there's a ground issue or maybe there's a, a routing issue with, with the cables is picking up some interference. Yes? Probably jumping the gun, but is there any kind of uh, auto tagging at the end where you can get it from a database or something? Yeah, that's coming, and, um, and it's coming slowly. But what you have to do with this is you have to type in the track names. And yes, I agree, it's very convenient to be able to get something from CDDB or a grace note or something and fill out the, the track names automatically. But in practice, I mean, to just type in the track names is just so fast and easy. I mean, everybody types well nowadays. The hard part is finding out where the tracks begin and end. And there's some automation in here that really uh, is helpful. And I'll show you that. Now, let, let me tell you the difference between Pure Vinyl 3 and Pure Vinyl 4. Pure Vinyl 3, you drag the track, you drag the stylus, and you'll see uh, it'll generate a cue guide image to, to guide you to where to drag the, drag the stylus. To the place between the tracks, and you have to hunt for the quiet spot. It doesn't have to be the beginning of the track, but the quiet spot, roughly, somewhere in there. You hit Add Track, and then it will hunt and find the beginning of the, the next track. What happens in Pure Vinyl 4 is you drag the stylus and you let it go and it snaps to the, the track location. So you can see exactly where it thinks the track is going to be when you say add track. And this process is really fast. I can put tracks on a, you know, an album like this in 30 seconds. And I can show you that up, up in the exhibit room, uh, in the demo room. So it's like bang, 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 bang. The slower part is typing the track names, but it's not, like I said, it's not really a big deal. Yes? In the back. Um, I'm not personally with this. Is there uh, any kind of scratch? And click okay, and move good question. Three and have to change in four at all? No, there hasn't been any changes in, in version four uh, for scratch and, and uh, noise removal. Uh, there is a surgical pop and noise removal feature where you can pick a, a, a pop and it'll slice it out. One of the advantages of doing the RIAA in the digital domain is that you're capturing the, the audio before it's passed through an RIAA filter. Um, music is a, fil is, is a, s a signal source that's had the, the, it's been pre-compensated, and that's what the RIAA filter does when you play it back. However, physical defects on the album have not. And when you put those through an RAA filter, they get stretched out. So it, with a raw signal that's not RAA equalized, you have maybe, maybe five samples that, you have to, that are involved in the pop. But after the RAA filter, there's a lot more meat that you have to cut out. It, it'll be 30, 40, 50 samples. So it makes that a lot easier. Now, as far as overall noise reduction, we have lots of users that buy this program called Click Repair. You just take the files that Pure Vinyl creates and you run them through click repair if you need overall noise reduction. But of course, any noise reduction or automated click repair is going to eat out some of the music too. So uh, you know, usually try, you know, try to find a better copy of the recording. There's another really, really cool feature that's going to be coming. And um, I wanted to get it in version 4, but it's, it's going to address this in a way that's going to blow your mind. And it is just so cool. And I just wish I could tell you about it because it's so cool. It, it, because as a record collector and music lover, it, it's just it's it's a dream thing for this this sort of thing. But but um, that that's coming, and I, I don't want to say anything about it yet. But it's it's just so cool. Anyway, so we had another question. Here. Is there any um, any ways that DSD is better than Apple lossless? And can you do DSD files in uh, version four? Okay, uh, the question is more like, can I record DSD files in version four? Okay. Um, yeah, actually, uh, not yet, and uh, we've been, you know, lobbied by the the guys that make the hardware, saying, you know, when are you going to put DSD recording in pure vinyl? And it's like, okay, well, send me the hardware because I can't really make it until I have the hard. It's a chicken or the egg problem. But I'm resistant to do it. I'm going to do it, but I'm resistant because you won't be able to do the RAA correction in the digital domain. 
computers just aren't fast enough yet to do it in real time with the DSD samples. So what you have to do is you have to convert it to intermediate PCM at a really high sample rate, then do the filtering, then you have to remodulate back to DSD. Just can't do it in real time on a computer. So uh, maybe 10 years from now, computers will be fast enough that you can do that. It just isn't worth giving up the advantages of RAA in the digital domain for a putative advantage of DSD capture from a regular phono stage. If you capture the raw signal DSD, then you're still going to have to convert it back to PCM to do the RAA filtering. So um, I would really like, like to say that that's a really great thing to have DSD recording, but there's just some, um, some things that you have to give up that I don't, I don't think it's a good compromise. So, uh, you know, some people don't like that answer, but uh, that's the way I've seen it. And I've, I've been doing this sort of stuff for a long time, so. Yes? Uh, two quick questions. One, so if you are using something like click repair, is that better to do on the flat transfer as opposed to one yes. that's been corrected? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Because it, it, it'll less meat to chop out, yeah. And then as far as the RCA to TRS adapters that you yeah. make, um, as far as the loading on that, is that very cartridge specific or is that just moving magnet versus moving coil? Or if I was to change my cartridge, am I going to have to get different adapters? Um, yeah, it's very specific across those categories, low output moving coil versus moving magnet. And I, I like to say low impedance cartridge versus high impedance because there's some moving coils that have high output, but they're high impedance. So those have very, quite different loading requirements and you can't have one adapter that will do both of those. However, for moving coil, it's more general. For instance, uh, the typical load requirements by most cartridge manufacturers is in the 100 ohm range, something like that. Uh, and they give you actually a range of, of values. Um, if you're very picky about the sound of the cartridge at different cartridge loadings, then yes, you'll have to um, get different adapters for different cartridges. But I found that it doesn't change that much. Some cartridges that have very low amounts of damping are really sensitive to loading and you have to load them down quite a bit or else they'll be bright. But those are unusual cartridges. It's something that you just have to try if you want to you know, switch cartridges. Does that answer your question? I think so within moving magnet cartridges, if I've got one that's set up a loaded adapter, within the, that range, it'll still work? Yeah, typically, yeah. That, and again, the typical loads are, well, it's always 47,000 ohms, and uh, it's going to be maybe 200 picofarads. So some cartridges, like Shure's, Shure cartridges, want really high capacitive load up to 400 picofarads. Uh, but typically it's around 150 to 200 for most cartridges. Uh, I'm going to lift the stylus now and uh, I want to show you what happens. Oh, I do have the other version here. I, I'm, not, I'm not goofing around here. I really did. I, I copied this for somebody here at the show and I said, I'm going to bring this to your room and you can try it. And then I found a few problems and I said, um, no, you probably don't want to use this for demos because you, know, you can never have a crash during a demo. So I can do this, this is great. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, and of course the most important part of, of this is the uh, differences in the editing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna record a couple more tracks from the other side of the album. Then I'm just gonna copy this new version of Pure Vinyl on here and then we'll use that for the editing. Okay, see, I knew, I, like I said, you know, during the question and answer, I'd think of something, and that I didn't think I'd think of that, but uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, just give me just a second. I want to, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay, so when I'm ready, uh, click when ready to continue recording. Okay, see, and it, during that time, it mutes, mutes the audio. I can clean the stylus. I can go get a cup of coffee. It'll just patiently wait until I'm ready to resume the recording. So now I just drop the stylus <coughs> and the microphone. Okay, and then recording. Now we're recording side two. Okay. So Rob, you've been a strong advocate um, of DSD as a digital format in a number of symposia and seminars. I'm just kind of curious, with respect to your own personal listening, do you find that what's your mix of you know ADD stuff? You from LPs that you listen to personally versus, say, DSD content or original digitally sourced content? Um, there's no hard and fast rule because it gets back to, number one, the source of 
you know, the, the, the reissues. Okay, so if we put that aside, and let's say that we got a really good master tape that's been cared for and no print through, no deterioration, and they make a DSD copy of that. And I got a vinyl record, and I got no reason to suspect that that mastering is better, then I would probably go with the DSD. Okay, now DSD is a great format for internet music transfers. It's very efficient, uh, but uh, you know what you didn't ask me and what I'm gonna say is that uh, I think today's PCM is better than DSD. Hi today's really good PCM uh, converters are, are better. And I think, um, you know, when you look at the history of DSD, it was one bit audio, uh, <coughs> and that spec was frozen, you know, many years ago. But PCM has continued to evolve, and now we got, you know, multi bit modulators in PCM converters, which do not have this problem of this noise floor, the, the ultrasonic noise of the DSD, their lower distortion, lower noise, they're just better. So, um, again, if I had a choice between this piece, that PCM and the DSD, I'd take the PCM. But often you don't have a choice. I'm perfectly happy with the DSD. I think it's really great. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff that I have on vinyl that they're reissuing on DSD, I'm sampling that. and and some of those I'm, I'm playing instead of the vinyl. I hate to say, but, uh, you know, but there's still a lot of room for vinyl left. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Was DSD the only thing you were talking about when you were talking about competitive to vinyl in terms of, uh, what were you thinking of in terms of uh, the direct competition that there's not as much weight you Okay, um, provided that you have good, you know, uh, sources, good master tapes, then it would be DSD or PCM, okay? Today's PCM, okay? Now, arguably, when DSD, DSD format was frozen, you know, there were advocates on both sides of the fence, but the PCM converters back then were not as good as they are today. So DSD or PCM, I'd, I'll take either one, whatever I can get. And bear in mind that a lot of the PCM downloads available on the internet today were converted from DSD masters. So you're really hearing these, you're, hear, you're hearing the converter that they used. And you know, uh, some of you know that in, in the pure music product that we have, you can play DSD files on any DAC that you have because we convert the PCM in real time. And it's a really good PCM, DSD to PCM converter. Um, in fact, I think that the differences between a native DSD streaming and the DSD to PCM conversion is so small that you, might not, you probably won't notice it and it's certainly smaller than the differences in sound quality between different DACs. Yes, Roger. You want to talk about the difference in the metadata capabilities of the different file formats like WAV, AIM, FLAC, that type of thing? Yeah, sure. Um, and it's something I didn't really get into when I mentioned WAV. I said WAV's okay, but the problem with WAV is that it doesn't embed metadata and tags in the file and it stores it in a separate place. So it's a problem on just general computer maintenance, backups and things, because you have to remember to back up this other file. Otherwise, if you don't, and your hard drive crashes, you'll lose all your metadata. I think it's easier to just use a file that has embedded metadata like AIFF or Apple Lossless. Uh, and again, I have mentioned AIFF has its own problems in this application because of the file sizes that are generated. Okay, so let's see. All right, we're just about done with that track. Okay, so now here's in, sort of an answer to your question. That's the rumble and noise and, and crap, and now that's the, the track again. So uh, you, you can see we, we had plenty of room there left over. Um, of course, if you have a really good turntable with really low rumble um, and you play a recording that doesn't have a lot of noise on it from the cutter head advancing, uh, then you, you really do have to have a very, very well set up analog uh, front end to avoid any noise. Okay, so now we're done. And what I do now is I click open in pure vinyl and stop recording. <coughs> and what it's gonna do now is take the audio in the recording and generate a cue guide image that we're gonna use to edit the recording and set up the tracks. This is patented, and 
it's funny because the overseas patent office was a lot faster in responding, the British patent office was a lot faster in responding to the United States patent office. But they, they, have, a, they have it rough there, you know, the budget's really terrible. They're doing a hell of a job. What, sorry? Yes. Uh, don't get me started. Okay. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quit this version of Pure Vinyl, and I'm going to copy this one that I have on this thumb drive so we can see this cool new editing feature. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'll move this out of the way. Oh, it's stubborn. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's paid for software, and that's that's what, what we market is the software, which is called Pure Vinyl. And we also make some phono stages, which I haven't gotten into really because that's this isn't really about our, our products so much, but the software, yeah. So uh, we do make some phono stages for the very highest quality uh, transfers, which are just gain, and then you would use a higher quality analog to digital converter, such as the one we have up in our room, uh, 582 uh, Lynx Hilo. And actually, it's kind of cool because um, they have just come out with a new uh, interface on that. It's the world's first Thunderbolt audio interface on the market. And we have one, one up in our room. And, and they're actually going to be announcing it at AES uh, next week. And they let me uh, talk about it so and let me use it. And it's great because it's not something that would make you want to dump your old interfaces, but it's nice because you can finally daisy chain other peripherals with a Thunderbolt. And uh, we have um, Mike Nicoletti from Nix, Lynx up, up in our, we're, we're co-exhibitors here. And he was telling me how they had uh, four of their Aurora, Aurora, Aurora converters running on one Thunderbolt line, 96 channels, IO, 96 IO. And, and, and <laughs> still room, you know? So really great. Okay, uh, let's see, I copied that. Okay. Let's see if it'll let me copy it to the root. Okay, good. Do you have a certification process for some of the equipment that you're uh, not really. Uh, it's basically as long as it's compatible with the Apple uh, platform, it'll work. Um, and in a given price range, there's only a certain number of products that are out there, and they all work. Okay, so starting at $200 for the Tascam, it's great. It works really great. The DAC is a little harsh, and uh, uh, but the recordings it makes are really nice. So if you upgrade your DAC, then they sound better. So uh, they all work great. OK, here we go. And so <clears throat> it remembers the last recording that I have open. So I can just go right to the editing step by clicking here. And it's going to open that recording. And it's going to put in track number one for me. And then now what I do is I drag the stylus here for the first track, and you see it, it's gone to the flat line on the waveform. Split track. And then now I'm going to just drop the stylus right here, way before the groove, let go, and you see it jumps right to the groove. And you see the waveform is also flat here, so split track. And again, this is uh, new in, in, in Pure Vinyl 4. And then finally, the last track will do that. Okay, and then I'll flip the record over by clicking on the spindle. And, um, okay, let's put in a track right there. Okay, and that's it, basically. All right, then I say save and uh, save. Oh, there's another feature in Pure Vinyl 4, which is kind of cool. If you like to play these recordings in this user interface, looking at the, the disk spin, is you can click on a track and say, 
save, and I want to start that with that track when I open the recording, so it'll automatically jump to that spot. Okay, so now what we do is we preview our edits. So I'll click on that. Oh, I turned on the volume, sorry. Okay, I'll go back and I'll click on that. I'll click on the next one. I'll click on the next one. Okay, and you see I didn't have to diddle around with that at all. It snapped right to the, the track cue perfectly. Of course, this doesn't work for live albums or things where they fade gradually, but you can turn off that feature in that case. You can actually specify down to the sample where you want the track marker to be played. But this, this automated feature is, is a really, I really like it. And, um, you know, well, you know, when Pure Vinyl started out in 2003, I was writing it for myself. And, you know, it looked like vinyl was really dead. And we introduced it in 2006. Vinyl was really dead. But back it up. And, uh, you yeah, know, this is great. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, um, well, that's it for the seminar, and thanks. Uh, you were a really great, attentive audience, and I really appreciate all the questions, and uh, thank you.